Welcome back, everybody. Second video this week has to do with subgroups and order in the counting principle. We'll go over four different types of counting, uh, more specifically with the multiplication principle and all the different subtypes we can have. Jump right into it with the first one. Uh, I call this the combination lock example. This example shows how many different ways can I set a combination to a lock with four digits. We've all seen combination locks like this. Well, this actually turns out to be a pretty straightforward application of the principles of counting, just like we saw in the last video, maybe with the YouTube video ID. Uh, only this time, it's a much smaller number. If I have four digits set, and a digit in each case, looks like I can set 10 different ways for the first number, 10 different ways for the second number, etc. And times 10 times 10 times 10 ends up being 10,000. Or if you wanted to use exponents like we did in the last video, 10 to the fourth power. So that's a pretty straightforward application. Um, it's one that allowed us to repeat numbers. Notice how there were no restrictions on which numbers could be picked in this combination. If I did set a restriction, then I would have had to account for that in the way that I counted. Um, the order, it kind of, I know the, 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 the board says with order here, but the order doesn't make a whole lot of, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. If we're allowed to repeat, then does order matter? I mean, in the sense that, yes, the order of the numbers in the combination matters, but if I'm allowed to repeat, then I could have a combination like five, 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 five. So the idea of order doesn't make a whole lot of sense when it comes to picking with replacement. And the idea of picking with replacement won't be as important in the other examples. And so order will become important. That is, if I'm only allowed to pick each digit once, then it very much matters if I pick one, two, three, four in that order. Or four, three, two, one in this order. But when I'm allowed to pick the same number four times, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to talk about order. We'll use exponents to do this kind of counting, just like we did in the last video. So let's modify the way that we need to count by modifying our example. I'll call this the museum example. We'll come back to this example a lot. A museum has five paintings, and they need to hang them on a wall in order. How many different ways can I hang these five paintings on a wall? OK, so just like the combination lock example, I think it starts off well enough. There are five paintings, so I could pick the first painting five different ways. But once I've hung that painting on the wall, I can no longer pick it again. See, this is why it's important that we have no replacement. Now, I'm not allowed to put this paint, painting back in the stack and pick it again. So now if there's five to go on the wall for the first one, well, now there's only four to go on the wall in the second one. I can only pick that four different ways. Same thing all the way down the line. I've picked the second painting. Now there's only three paintings to choose from. Then two. Then the last painting is pretty much determined by the first four choices. There's only one way to put that last painting on the wall. Five times four times three times two times one. Go to my calculator. That's what is five times four times three times two times one. It is 120 ways. Okay. So this kind, of, this kind of picking and this kind of selection is pretty common. So we need to come up with a, a more efficient, faster way to calculate this. Uh, let's generalize it out a little bit. I mean, I know I picked five paintings here for the sake of example to make it faster and easier to calculate. What if I were picking 10 different paintings? How many, how many ways? Say, OK, well, however many paintings I have to start with, Call that n. I know it's kind of weird to talk about numbers in this way. Okay, just like algebra, n. And then the next painting would be 
in minus one different ways to do it because I've already picked one. Comes out from the total. Then in minus two, you can see the pattern. I keep going until I get down to one. So however many I started with, it's just that number times that number minus one times that number minus two. And I keep repeating that pattern all the way down until I get to one. I can't give you a number result here, of course, because this result kind of depends on what n was in the first place. We saw up above, if n is 5, then I have 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 120. But if n were something larger, like 10, I would have to go to the calculator. 10 times 9 times 8, 7, way down to 1. So I've got the pattern here. But there's got to be a faster way to do this. And it turns out there is. We do this so often right, that this kind of counting comes up on a calculator. You can see the absurdity of having to do this manually in this example. How many different ways can the results of a 200-person race result? You can think of this as ranking the entire leaderboard, 200 people long. There's 200 ways that the first place finisher could finish, 200 ways or not 200 ways, 199 ways, second place finish or finish, 198, etc. I'm not going to bother writing all this out. I trust that you can see it's going to take a while to do that. Times 3 times 2, all the way down until I get to 1. And if even if you had the fortitude to type all those numbers into your calculator, I doubt your calculator would be able to tell you a number that large. It doesn't seem like it would be that big, but it's actually a huge, huge number. I'll show it to you in a minute. Uh, but the way that we ask our calculator to calculate these with a special notation, because we see these things so often, will use a new notation in our calculators to handle it, it's called the factorial notation. If you've ever seen an exclamation point on your calculator, this is exactly what it is. On my calculator, which is a Casio calculator, it is right up here, sort of the top, top right, but I've got to hit the shift button to get to it. One of those gold inscriptions above the button, which I need to press the second or the shift button to get to. If I press five exclamation point in my calculator, it should tell me 120, and it does, because that's what we calculated manually before. We knew this one should be 120. Let's ask my calculator, what is 200 factorial? I can't see it right now, but it is giving me math error. It, it's a number far too large for even the calculator to show. Uh, so I'm going to have to call in the big dogs here. I'm going to have to call in calculators on the internet, Wolfram Alpha or something similar, to tell me what 200 factorial actually is. There it is. I'm going to paste it here so people coming back to look at it can see it. Oh my goodness. I don't even want to try to give a name to this number. It breaks it up into groups of three, but there's so many groups of three that I can't even realistically tell you how large that number is. Even in scientific notation, that thing would be absolutely huge. And so this kind of growth, right, factorials, they get really big really quickly. Uh, there's no way that we can handle all that. So that presents a new problem in and of itself. If we have to deal with numbers this large, yes, the notation makes it easier to do so, but what happens if we want to do a related problem? Maybe I'm talking about how many different ways can the top five out of 200 finish? That's a much more reasonable problem, but it's one that I can't, I certainly can't go to the calculator and ask it for what 200 factorial is directly. I'm going to have to come up with a way to 
deal with this number, but not quite all the pieces of this number. That's the subgroup. Here, let me modify the museum problem. So, just as before, I'm placing five paintings on a wall, but now I'm talking about five paintings out of a possible 20 paintings. So, not every one of them goes on the wall, only five out of the 20 possible paintings. Let's see. If there's 20 paintings in total, that must mean there are 20 different ways I can select the first painting. It means there are 19 ways I can select the second. This pattern looks familiar. 18, 17, 16. But now I do not need to go for the rest of the pattern, 15, 14, etc. I can stop here because I only wanted five paintings out of 20. Now again, this, was, this answer is small enough my calculator can help. It is 20 times 19, 18, 17, 16. My calculator tells me 1860480. But even that, decently big number. We can use factorial notation to help us out here. Even though we aren't going all the way down to 1, I know that 20 factorial would go all the way down to 1. 15 times, and I'm just going to block it out. This is the part which we do not need. I do not need the 15 down to 1 part of this factorial. I only need the 20 down to 16 part of this factorial. So what I'll do is I'll use fractions to help me cancel out the parts that I don't actually want. I'll use the fraction. Say, well, let me take this whole, whole factorial and place it over 15 times 14 times 13 all the way down to 1. But what is 15 times 14 times 13 all the way down to 1? Isn't that... 15 factorial according to our notation. So if I want to cancel out all that part, let me take 20 factorial and divide by 15 factorial. Okay, so that seems like something my calculator will be able to do. Again, 20 factorial is going to be a very big number, 15 factorial is going to be a very big number. But your calculator is programmed very specifically to cancel out the fraction. It's not going to actually calculate 20 times 19 times 18 times 17 times 16, etc. It's been programmed specifically to cancel out the part of this fraction which does cancel, because otherwise it, it would be far too large for the, even the calculator to handle. So it's been programmed specifically for this. 20 factorial divided by 15 factorial. Okay, that's actually less scary than it might sound. This 20 factorial divided by 15 factorial. That tells me that if I want a subgroup out of a larger group, it looks like I need to take the big factorial and divide it by a smaller factorial. Let's see if I can figure out where these come from. 20 is the big group number. 15 is the big group number, but it has the five paintings removed from it. You can think of that as 20 minus 5. That is the big group of 20 minus the 5 that I wanted to select from it. And then, in fact, that's another way you can, can view this part of the fraction. 20 minus 5 factorial. So if, if I wanted, for example, to go back to my marathon or race example, if I wanted to select only the top five finishers in that race, I might say 200 factorial divided by 200 
minus 5 factorial. That would cancel out everything that I didn't want, and it would leave me with 200 and 199 and 198 and 197 and 196. Just the top five finishers. And that's all the possible ways it could happen. My calculator would be able to do that for me. I could type into my calculator 200 factorial divided by 195 factorial. Oh, still too big for the calculator? Oh. 198. Three point zero four times ten to the eleventh power. It's still pretty big. Not too big for the calculator. That's still really big. This subgroups with order operation. It happens all the time when we're talking about probability counting. Uh, it happens so much that we give it its own button on the calculator and we give it a new notation called NPR. You might have seen this button in your calculator before, and you wondered. What's that weird NPR button? It means permutation. Got in my heading. Permutation. A permutation is a selection without replacement, but with order. So, for example, if I were picking letters, right, I could pick letters, and the order would matter. ABC would not be the same as CBA. And we did that just up above. We saw that the subgroups with order operation right, looked like a factorial. So if we, in this case, n would be total number we select from, r would be number in the group selected. So this is the blank out of blank kind of selection. Above, we did 5 out of 20 or 5 out of 200. That might look like out of 200, we select with order top 5. You might call that 200 permutation 5, 200 P5. Notice how the, the numbers N and R, in this case, they are down below the line. They're not exponents. Exponents are up above, but they are down below. That's just the notation. I did, I'm sorry I didn't make it up, but that's just what it is when you look at it in the textbook. Every now and again, some homework problems and some teachers might express this, you know, with this, which looks kind of like function notation, right? like the f of x kind of notation. I tend not to do that because we'll talk about a p function, an actual p function later on. I don't want to confuse it with permutation, so I tend not to use this notation when talking about permutation. Uh, your calculator, if you needed to type this into your calculator, would probably ask you to type 200, and then it has that special NPR button, show NPR, maybe, 5, that. So that's how your calculator might want to. I think my special Casio calculator, that special, you can buy one, they're like 20 bucks. I would type it into my calculator, and when I press the NPR button, it just gives me a big P, and it's in bold, 200 P5. So it looks pretty close to the math notation, it just doesn't have subscript. So I see 200 P5 in my Casio. So I would type this in. However we type it in, the formula for NPR we saw up above. That is, we start with the big group, we call it N in this case, and then we remove the subgroup from it, N minus R, then factorial. And again, I know it's algebraic notation. It might feel a little bit squishy just because it looks like algebra. But all that means is take the big factorial, remove the group from it, factorial that bottom result, and let the fraction cancel out everything that needs to be canceled out. That's all it means. 
As a matter of fact, you don't even have to use this formula with the factorial notation in it because we're going to be using our calculators. So going back to the museum example, five out of 20, I would ask you on, on, your, on your test work to identify this means 20 for mutation five. I will know what you mean when you write 20 for mutation five and then calculate. My, on my calculator, it, again, it just looks like 20 P5. If you were to manually type this in, it would look like this. That's 20 factorial divided by 15 factorial. And we've already seen that number, 1860480. But your calculator will tell you directly 20p5 is 1,860,480. So we've already gone two layers deep in sort of custom notation. We took the counting and formed the factorial notation from the counting. And now we've taken the factorial notation and used it to build the permutation notation. Luckily, we're not going to go any farther. We'll see another aspect of the permutation calculation, but I don't think we're going too much deeper with it. Permutation, again, it, it, we're picking a subgroup, and it is with order. So I could, I could, let's say, if I wanted to have a group of eight people out of it, I wanted to rank all eight of them. 8 permutation 8. That is possible. But if you type that into your calculator, I get 40,320. And compare that with just a straight 8 factorial, it would turn out to be exactly the same thing. You can think of the factorial as a special case, the permutation, or you could think of this permutation being a special case that results in the factorial. And I guess that shouldn't be surprising because we said factorial notation allows us to take an entire group and put it in order. The way I can put everybody in this group in order, and if I go to the permutation notation, that's a subgroup notation. Well, if I pick all eight members of the group, is that really a subgroup? The whole group, everybody. That's what factorials were talking about. I want everybody to be put in order. Eight for mutation, eight. Uh, we don't see this too often in this class, but we can have permutation zero. That doesn't make the most sense, but when you think about it, I'm asking how many different ways can I select zero things out of eight? Special case, it's really only one way to do it. Hopefully we won't have to see that too much in this class, but it is what you would get if you asked your calculator what eight permutation zero is. All about picking a subgroup and that subgroup being in order. Things like running races and determining the top three finishers that happens, right? If I'm talking about selecting, but that selection would matter the order, like what if I'm picking like a president, and vice president, and a secretary, treasurer? The, the, the order that I pick, the people to be in those positions matters. Who's president, vice president, secretary, who's the treasurer? That matters, the order. All of those situations would apply permutation logic. What if I don't care about order? What if I only want to select things out of a group? And I just want to know, are you select or are you not? You might think of this as like a raffle. I have a group of 25 people, and I want to select three of them to win a fantastic prize. I don't care about the order in which I select them. I only care that they have been selected. So I need to be able to account for this no order situation well. And we'll start with a simpler example. How many ways can I select 
two out of three movies. Go to the movie. We're gonna go way back. Rewind. Let's go to Blockbuster. Okay. Um, with order, it would be easy. That would be something we've already done. And so, if I called the movies A, B, and C, I can actually list out all the different ways I can put them in order. Ask your calculator how many different ways can I pick two out of three in order? It would tell you six. That's in order. So let's see what the actual combinations and the actual permutations are. See what's going on behind this and how it needs to change to account for the ordering or the lack of order. So let me call my movies A, B, and C. I'm going to try to get all the different ways to put these things in order. Basically what I'm doing is I'm... You see the way I'm doing this is I'm picking the first movie and then letting the two second movies change places. It gives two different ordering. B, A. So that gives me six different orderings of all three. Now it's interesting that picking two out of three also gives six different orderings. And the reason for that is, again, the way that I wrote these six combinations down, six permutations down, it's it's interesting because I told you, hey, I just want to pick the first one to be something and let the other two let the other two sort of flip flop places. And wouldn't you know it, letting the other two flip flop places, ignoring the first one, that is picking two out of three and letting them change order. I can see that directly in the way that I enumerated all the possibilities here. And that'll be true for every kind of permutation. That's kind of interesting. But here, I want to pick two out of three, and I want to do so without caring about the order. So let me erase the first movie here. This is my two out of three order. Again, I picked the first one, but I set it aside. Another way you can think about that is I picked one movie not friend. That was the first one that I erased. Now I'm only looking at the other two. Six ways to do that. But how many different ways if I don't care about the order? If I don't care about the order, these two groupings are the same. BC is the same as CB if I don't care about the ordering. These two are the same if I don't care about the ordering. These two are the same if I don't care about the ordering. As a matter of fact, I can always form these groups here. In this case, because each group has two things in it, I should divide this whole situation by two. There are six ways to do it, but I'm going to group them up in groups of two. That two comes from the number of different ways. That's the number of different ordering. But we've already talked about order earlier on. One of the first things we did was we said if I wanted to put things in order and I wanted all of them to shuffle around, that was a factorial thing. And so this is really too factorial because that's how many different ways I can put two things in order. Interesting. And so I am basically taking a permutation, that P notation, and dividing it by a factorial, which represents removing the order. Okay. 
Hmm. So if I wanted to put things in this subgroup, but not order this. Remember, R represented the number of things that I'm selecting, the number of the subgroup. So I started with the big N, select out of it R in PR, that permutation tells me how many ways I can select R out of N, but with ordering. And then I come behind it and I say, let me divide that by R factorial, the number of different ways I could put them in order. That's essentially putting them into these three box groups that you see above, but that may be a, a fairly large number of groups. I just did it with a small number to help us see it. This would take the big number of orderings and say, well, how many groups are there? Don't really care about order. I wanted to go back to the earlier notation. NPR, we already said was N factorial divided by N minus R factorial. I'm going to take this notation and I'm going to divide it by R factorial. And I know it doesn't seem like I'm, that, that divides it by R, R factorial. I don't want to have a fraction divided by another fraction kind of situation. I'm thinking about it as, well, this fraction times 1 over R factorial. That's how fraction multiplication works because I don't want to, I don't want to think about flipping and dividing and reciprocals. It's not fun. I'd rather say, well, let me take NPR and multiply times 1 over R factorial. That's why it sort of gets to show up in the denominator of this fraction and say, hey, that means this whole thing is divided by R factorial. Not bad. A little weird, but again, we don't have to memorize this factorial version of the formula. Your textbook will probably have this version of the formula in it, and it will say, oh, this is a, this is a wonderful way to do this kind of counting. But we can do a little bit better. Just like before, just like factorials, just like permutations, we invent a brand new notation to go along with this specific kind of counting. And that is combination in CR button on your calculator. We've already seen the formula. That is n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, as well as r factorial. And just like before, we don't memorize this version of, of the formula. Yes, we'll see it so we can manually check our answers if we need to. But your calculator's got an NCR button on it. My Casio calculator, my NPR, and my NCR both, they live right here above the multiplication and division button. But again, they're that golden color. I need to press the shift button. Use the shift multiply is NPR, shift, divide, is in CR. Okay, so if I do that, then if I, if I wanted to go back to my movie example, if I wanted to take three and select from it two movies with no ordering, that's three combination two. Again, your calculator might make this look like 3NCR2, or my Casio calculator just puts a big bold C in 3C2. However, your calculator asks you to enter this, it would be able to do this kind of counting for you directly. I could type 3 and 2. It says, Three different ways to do it. Just like up above, we had six divided by two, that was three. Three different groupings of ordering. So we can see that. Before we jump into the big example you see down below, let's do another smaller example. 
let's see, what if we wanted to pick, go back to the museum example. What if we wanted to pick five out of 20, but instead of being in order, that is hanging these paintings on the wall in order, what if I wanted to select five out of the 20 paintings to go in a special room? Hold on, let me highlight these paintings. So this month's feature painting. Now I just want to pick five out of the 20. Out of 20, select five. Now there's no ordering. So I would expect this number to be smaller than 20 P5. Remember, 20 P5 ended up being. I think 1.8 million? Yeah, 1860480. Let me do 20 combination five. My calculator says 15,504. According to my formula, that is 20 permutation five divided by five factorial. So we've actually got two or three different ways to look at this combination. But yes, we have our direct calculator method. Yes, we have the really, really old school factorial method here. Or I can do this kind of intermediate through the idea of what a permutation actually is. Again, Neither one of these see a lot of airtime in the sense that on your test, you probably won't need to write these down on a note card and memorize. We don't really use these formulas directly in this class. We more need to recognize what kind of counting is and which button should I use in my calculus. That's going to be more important in the longer run. At least Let's look at how combinations may show up in a more complicated counting scenario. So in this scenario, I'm picking an advisory council made up out of members from three classes that I have. Two members come from class A, four members come from class B, and one member comes from class C. So that means I have seven members of this council. But two of them come from class A, four of them come from class B, one of them comes from class C. And remember what our, our principles of counting say. If you are building one outcome out of its components, you probably need to multiply those components together. And because each one of these components is selecting a subgroup out of a class, each one of these components is a combination. Take a look. From class A, oops, ignore class B and class C for the moment. In class A, I'm selecting two members out of 20 in class A. How many different ways can I pick two out of 20? I don't care about the order here. They're, you're either on the council or you're not. So 2 out of 20 would be 20 combination 2. I don't even need to multiply individual numbers like I did before. I certainly could. If you completely blanked out on your test, you might say, oh, I know how to pick two people out of 20. That's 20 times 19. It'd give you the exact same thing. 20 combination 2 is 20 times 19, but then you got to divide by the two factors. It's, I won't say it's easier to do it this way, but if you did totally blink out on the test, it is possible. How many different ways can I pick four members out of 32? Or from class B? See, that's out of 32. Picking four, 32 combination four. Again, you might say, Professor, I know how to calculate that 32, 31, 30, 29. You just have to remember to go back and find out all the different orderings there. 
from class C. One member out of 13. So you could do 13 combination one. I think 13 would be actually easier in this case. How many different ways can I pick one out of 13? 13. <laughs> There's no such thing as ordering there. You could ask your calculator, what is 13? Combination one. It'll tell you 13. Calculator doesn't judge. It just tells you what the result is. So in this case, I think the 13 would actually be easier. But for consistency, if you wanted, if you wanted to panicking, you want to say, oh no, I want to be consistent the way I calculate all this. I will type into my calculator 20 combination 2 times 32 combination 4 times. 13, combination 1. That's exactly the way it would look on my Casio calculator. 2, 4. Okay. My calculator tells me this is 8, 8, 8, 2, 1, 2, 0, 0. 88 million. 821,200. That's how many different ways I select my advisory council of students out of all three of my classes. A lot of your homework problems and some videos on the internet might show this kind of counting. They might do it. I've seen a lot of problems that look like when you're playing poker. And how many different ways can I select a three of a kind out of a deck of cards? I really try to avoid the playing card problem. Yes, they used to be a really good way to see probabilities and countings. Uh, when everybody knew what a deck of cards looked like, how many were in each set, it's not that common anymore. So I don't really like using those examples. Sometimes the sort of cultural implications of having to know what a deck of cards is, how many are in it, and what the different classifications are, sometimes that can get a little bit frustrating because. Everyone talks like, oh, everyone knows that. 13 clubs, a deck of cards. I might know that, but everybody knows that off the top of their head anymore. So I try to avoid the playing card problem. And when I do have them, I try to include a little graphic. Mind you, okay, here's what a playing card deck looks like. And I'm not doing that to insult you. So again, if you grew up in a strong poker playing family, and I'm not doing that because I don't think you remember what a playing card deck looks like. It's just there if we need a little bit of. All right, let's summarize and then get finished with this. We talked about four different kinds of counting overlapping with last time. Exponent counting, factorial counting, permutation counting, combination counting, and PR and CR kind of. And they differ in these three aspects. Is there replacement? That is, am I allowed to pick the same thing twice? Does it allow for subgroup? That is, picking 5 out of 20, some number less than the entire group. And am I allowed to pick in different ordering? Does this press all the different order? Exponent counting allows replacement. Exponent counting was the combination locking. Am allowed replacement? And if I'm allowed replacement, then subgroups and order, they cease to make a whole lot of sense in that context. Because if I'm allowed to do replacement, then it, what does it matter if I have some or all? If I'm allowed to do replacement, I can pick the same thing four times, five times. Order ceases to matter. So you're talking about replacement counting, chances are you need exponents or multiplication, just straight multiplication to do it. No fancy tools for replacement. All the rest of the types of counting we talked about have no replacement. That's what made the exponent special. All the rest have no replacement. Factorials, 
permutations and combinations are different because in factorials, remember factorials required us to do the entire group at a time. Five factorial had to go all the way down to one. Five times four times three times one. 800 factorial, start at 800, all the way down to one. We were not allowed to stop in the middle. And so we were not allowed to have subgroups in factorial counting. Anytime the problem says, hey, you need to pick five out of this group, you should know, oh, that's not the whole group. I can't do five. Factorials appear in the counting, right? The formulas for the permutation and combination, they appear in there. But it's not just a straight factorial. Both the permutations and the combination allow sub. Factorials allowed order is how many different ways can I select things hang on a wall in order. The factorials example you can think of as the museum example, but we did modify it in some of the other situations. Permutations, subgroups with order, combinations, subgroups out order. So you can answer these three questions. Am I allowed replacement? Am I allowed subgroups? Do I want a group that's not the whole group? And do I care about the ordering? And your answers to those three choices tells you what kind of counting is probably the best in this class. And this is something I might write down on a note card to help bring during my exam, because this is something which helps decide what kind of counting. This doesn't tell me how to do the counting. Your calculator will do the counting formula for you. But where you might lose points on an exam is I picked the wrong kind of count. I did combination instead of permutation. Or I did permutations instead of straight x. But picking the wrong formula in the first place, you'll, you'll tend to lose a lot more points than any individual calculation. I tend to be really lenient with calculation. If I see that you just type something into the calculator incorrectly, but I'm less lenient for, I didn't know what kind of counting needed to be done in the first place. That's a more conceptual. This, this table, I think, is probably the most useful thing. That we have. Okay, All, enough of counting for this week. Hopefully, we'll get back into a little bit more concrete stuff next week. Um, although, it's not too far from it. Um, we'll talk more about probability next week. See you then.